for us in the MLS, NFL, MLB, NBA, and you know NHL, the process is very similar. So it's what are those internships like? Where have you volunteered? What have you done? I think back to when I was in college, a internship was suffice, and that's what was being asked for. And there were there were plenty in the program that yeah, I don't need an internship. I'll just I'll I'll get a job, and they probably struggled out of the gate. And so at that time it was imperative for me to get one, if not two, and just layer on that experience because then you get your first job. And then from there, after your first job, you're growing and you're growing and you're growing. G'day guys, coming up on the show today is Jordan Ionuzzi. Jordan is the Senior Manager of Corporate Partnerships at New York Red Bulls in Major League Soccer. He's an all-round great guy with a ridiculous resume, which includes organizations such as Major League Baseball, Brooklyn Nets, and now the New York Red Bulls. Lots to look out for today, including his journey in commercial sport, how he learned to sell, and what it's like working in some of the biggest organizations in world sport. Let's go. I started volunteering. It's all about who you know in sport. Am I going to be calling the last 10 seconds of the grand final? You can connect with the interviewer. The hand goes up when they've got to make a decision. Having a network is one of the most important things you can do. I didn't necessarily follow my passion. I followed my curiosity. Once you've worked in sport, there's no going back. And then lo and behold, before I left, I got offered two. Hello and welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast, the ultimate guide to make it in the sports industry. I'm Ryan Walker. Joining me is the big bull, Ruben Williams, and we are two mates who met at Cricket Australia. Each week, we learn how people made it in the sports industry and then tease out their career decisions, work habits, skills, and all the things they do to make them great. So you can learn how to get your first job in sport or your next job in sport and even just progress your career. Rubes, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well, mate. Plenty happening in the community at the moment, enjoying Melbourne life, so everything's going good. It is all happening at the moment. Now, I've got a quick question for you. Today, we are talking to Jordan Ionuzzi, who is big in the corporate partnerships world over in the US. Um, I've got a question for you. Out of all the partnerships you've seen in sport, what is the most nostalgic partnership you, you've seen? Oh, that's just, there's geez. a few favourites that come to mind over the years, but in your 28, 29 years, yeah. what's your favourite out there? Uh, I am still 28, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> we're getting towards the, the 29. Birthday's not too far away. Yeah. I hope you've remembered. Yeah. Um, uh, most nostalgic partnership. Well, like, like I grew up loving Australian cricket, so I always remember like the VB or the Commonwealth mm. Bank logo on the Australian test shirt. Yeah. That's probably the most iconic one for me. I'm not sure if that's a great thing, it being alcohol related, but um, that's v- okay. VB did a good job back in the day. They did <laughs> do a great job. Yeah. I remember um, on the topic of cricket, I, re- I remember one of the worst, mm. and that was the orange logo. Oh, do you remember yeah. that on the test shirt? Yep. It turned into three mobile yes. as well. Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh, other ones that come to mind are SGIO over in Perth. Oh, yes. With when the, I f- the yellow hands behind the goals. That is yeah, iconic. When I first started going to the footy, I remember hearing one of the, uh, the you know, person over the mic going, S-G-I-O, go, Eagles, go. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember that now forever. Um, but it is interesting. There's so many. We could have a, an hour long conversation on what about the sponsors. Was it Carlsberg who used to sponsor Liverpool? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now that that I is rem- nostalgic. Yes, I remember that curly handwriting plastered across the, yeah. the yellow jersey. That's that's never lost me. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Mm. What a great topic. Mm. We'll talk about that on the community today. I might do a post about that. Mm. Anyway, Rose. Speaking of the community, what's uh, what's been happening? Yeah. So I've got to give a big shout out firstly to one of our men- members, Martin Jennings. Now mm. Martin's been around for a while. He, uh, I remember he jumped on the opportunity to work the T20 World Cup when they got involved and recruited a whole lot of members for the tournament. Yep. Martin has just been offered a contract by Visit Victoria to work on the government side of the FIFA Women's World Cup from start of this year until the tournament finishes in August. So well done nice. to you, Martin. That's going to be an incredible project to, to work on. Uh, there's also plenty of jobs going. Cricket New South Wales have just jumped in and posted up a whole lot of cricket manager jobs in multiple yeah. locations. So In uh, Newcastle. Newcastle, so yeah. If you know anyone in Newcastle, 
absolutely awesome opportunities. Career yeah. managers is an incredible job. So. Beautiful part of the world. Yeah. Plenty of listeners come from Newcastle too, so to shout out to them. Mm. And uh, some upcoming events as well, which are a jammed pack at the moment. These Ask Sports Grad sessions uh, are seriously ones to, to get excited for, particularly this one. You might have heard on the podcast last week, Melissa Lawton came from Sale GP, Chief Content Officer. Well, she's coming on Ask Sports Grad to chat all things sp- social media and, and uh, broadcasting. So she's coming up on Wednesday night on um, the 1st of March. So if you want to meet Melissa, ask her questions directly, then get excited for that. And uh, just after recording this one, we've just arranged another one with Jordan Ionuzzi to, to come on on Thursday the 9th of March. Going to do a lunchtime session for that. So plenty Jeez. coming up <laughs> if you want to get involved and uh, ask direct questions to our podcast guests or of us. Lots more topics coming up in the realm of LinkedIn, networking, that kind of thing too. So yeah, stick around for those. But um, if you want to stay up to date with uh, all the wins, all the jobs, all the events, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter. goes out every Friday for a bit of fun in your inbox. Um, and if you want to subscribe to that, then head to sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter and you can join that every Friday. Incredible. Jay, that's a, a jam-packed event schedule coming up. Mm. You can literally meet Melissa and Jordan. That's just incredible. Mm. So get involved with that. Can't recommend it enough. In the meantime, though, grab a pen, enjoy this chat with Jordan Ainuzi. Before we jump into the episode, we've got a quick message from our good friends at Deakin University. Deakin has been a huge supporter of sports grad since day one. If you're currently studying or you've just finished studying, having a postgrad qualification in sports management on your resume can give you a huge leg up over other potential candidates applying for that same role. So if you want to pump up your resume and get specialized knowledge in sports behavior, law, marketing, ethics, finance, governance, and strategy, take a look at Deakin's postgrad qualifications. Their Master of Business in Sports Management is not one of, but the best one in Australia, ranked at number one. So add a postgrad to your resume, and that's our tip for the episode. Jordan, welcome to the Sportsgrad podcast. Thanks for having me on, guys. Jordan, it's awesome that you're jumping on all the way from, from New York City. Um, we love getting to chat to international guests and finding out what's going on around the world. And we're going to dig into some of your experience, which covers just about every single major US sport. But you have, in fact, spent a bit of time out in Australia and in our beloved town of, of Melbourne and been in Sydney. Tell us a bit about what you're doing in Australia. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it there. Um, I had worked with the Australian Baseball League and Major League Baseball for a couple of years between, I think it was 2012 and 2014, and was really tasked to drive commercial revenue for uh, the sport of baseball and, and you know, hopefully grow the sport of baseball through through the investment of Major League Baseball. Um, in Sydney, I was working for the league office and working across their sponsorship and commercial department to look at league partnerships. And then uh, a year later, you know, I think as, as most do, they, they get the opportunity um, to stay on, which, which I, you know, didn't even hesitate for. Um, it was to work with one of the teams in Melbourne, uh, some of the Melbourne Aces. And there, it was more of an overcompassing commercial role. So in addition to sponsorship, it was corporate sales. So, your, your, you know, your suite revenue and your, your group sales. Uh, as well as getting involved in, in nitty gritty, you know, merchandise sales, concession sales, things that, you know, candidly I hadn't done prior, but you, you figure it out on the go uh, and you learn, you learn through your, uh, your mistakes. Now, I'm wondering if you were involved in this because I believe the Melbourne Aces have one of the best hospitality experiences in sport <laughs> anywhere in the world. And somehow I found myself on the invite list from, from Jet Careers who, who own the team and uh, got whipped out to, to Laverton on a 40 degree night to sit directly behind home base, only separated from the catcher by a net. And then we had someone bringing out Corona Ritas. I'd never heard of a Corona Rita before, <laughs> which is a, a beer tipped into a margarita glass. And then there was hot dogs and ice creams. Did you have anything to do with the hospitality experience there? I, I, I can't I can't take full credit. Uh, you know, jet couriers can, can have that. Um, the, the ideation behind it's incredible um, and they do an amazing job. 
that experience, as you mentioned, is it's hands down one of the one of the best experiences and unique experiences. And for those that haven't witnessed it and are you know in Australia or local in Melbourne, uh, you have to check it out. It's it's one of a kind. Well, if Jet Couriers are listening, we'd love to come back. I know Ruben's experience. We would absolutely love to get down to the Melbourne Aces. So. We'll see how we go with that one. Mm, they might want to sponsor this next segment as well. They might as well. And the next <laughs> segment is called Quick Fire Questions. And Jordan, this is basically where we get to hear a little bit more about you, unearth a bit of gold. If there's something super interesting, we'll, we can check back at the end. But Ruben and I will just fire some questions at you and we'll, we'll learn a bit about you and yeah. I'll let Rudes fire off first. Awesome. Jordan, first one, what was your first ever job? So my, my first ever job um, was working in food demonstrations in supermarkets. So those people, uh, I don't know how common it is in Australia, but in the States, you know, on aisle four, they've got samples. Um, it's, it's incredibly nerve wracking when you're, when you're young and you've got to approach people that are there, not for samples, but to pick up their groceries and you're there asking them to try samples and, and ultimately try to convert them to buy that bag of chips that, that, that you're sampling. Um, my, my father worked in the food industry. So naturally that was him saying, you know, you're going to get some experience one way or the other <laughs> and get out there and do it. Nice. Some of that early sales coming through early. Mm. Um, did you go to uni? And if so, what did you study? Yeah. Yep. So I went to Western New England university, uh, in Springfield, mass. Uh, it's actually the home of the basketball hall of fame. Uh, I studied sports management. So that was, that was just when I think sports management was starting to, to take off, um, it caught my eye and uh, it's, you know, it was beauty from there on. And Jordan, your favorite sporting moment? I go back to the 1996 World Series, uh, Yankees, Braves. It was the beginning, truly really the beginning of the dynasty. I grew up in a Yankee household, um, you know, here in the tri-state. You're, you're either a Yankee fan or a Mets fan. Uh, you can't be a Boston fan. So, uh, you know, naturally as a Yankee fan, that's what you know that that team to me was was the beginning of what was the dynasty um and they did it the right way and i always admired that and i i just have such a fond memory um i you know the power of sports and the the emotion of sports i remember exactly where i was exactly where i was sitting on that final out you know third base side charlie hayes um so yeah that's that's definitely number one nice what's your favorite interview question to ask a candidate so I usually, I usually spin it. I, I would say conversely understanding what culture, what culture means to you, um, both from a candidate and as an employer standpoint, I think what I've found in my career thus far is culture goes a long way. Um, it's certainly not a buzzword and, and something that shouldn't be taken lightly. And, you know, you have to enjoy where you are and the people you work with, um, and understanding that the culture around you is, is where you want to be. It's, it's important to, to ask those questions um, and, and not be shy about it. Nice one. And what is one book or podcast you'd recommend that has helped you at work? So there, there was one I read a, a couple of years ago, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, he's a, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's, so he's a former FBI uh, hostage negotiator. And just having that perspective, um, it's, it's unique, right? Cause it's not our typical, atypical, you know, sports sales or sales or negotiation. Like it is, it is an FBI negotiator giving you tips from his perspective that you can apply in the real world. Um, but you know, I think, I think if you take a, take a peek at that, you'll, you'll get something out of it. Yeah, I know, I've, I've read that book. It's terrific. And he comes up on my Instagram feed all the time. I think masterclass just, <laughs> push his ads continuously to, towards me. They're trying to say something, I think. Get it. Get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you associated with any grassroots clubs? So so I, I'm not currently, but growing up, I, I played, you know, participated in baseball and soccer, um, basketball up through high school. Um, and then I switched to, to wrestling my freshman year of high school. And I always like to add the, the wrestling element. I had had no experience going into it. Um, and I know it's a little bit foreign in Australia, uh, but the lessons that it taught me on and off the mat, just in terms of grit, you know, you know, digging down deeper. Um, I, I pull a lot out of that for, for just what I do on a day-to-day -day business. And then on my personal life, um, it taught me a lot. 
talking about. That, that'd be a good fact to bring into your negotiations as well, because no one would want to mess with you after <laughs> learning you're a college wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> And last one, if you had 30 minutes to pick anyone's brain, who would it be? Derek Jeter. Um, I've always, I've always emulated him. Um, you know, we kind of grew up in that same era and, and, you know, played baseball in that same time frame. Um, but outside of his incredible accomplishments on the field, how he carried himself off the field is, is everything and, you know, everything I'd want to be. He always did it the right way. You, you know, you think of Frank Sinatra in my way, like, he did it. He did it the right way, um, and I think there's a lot to be learned. If, if you know, if I'm telling my son or or, or daughter like how to carry yourself, it's, it's be like DJ. Um, do it the right way. I'm glad you mentioned um, Derek Jeter because, in a very long winded way, Derek Derek Jeter was the inspiration for this podcast. So. I'm not sure you, you probably are aware of his um, platform, the Players Tribune, that gives players a, a platform to share their stories. Um, for those in Australia, the Athlete's Voice does a very sort of similar thing. Way back in 2016, a former boss of mine sent me a link to the Players Tribune. And I was like, oh, this is great. You can get all the insights from athletes. And at the time, I was studying sport management. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if you could get the insights of people working in sport management? And so that led to the start of Sports Grad as a very amateur YouTube channel before Ryan came aboard and we redeveloped the whole thing in 2020. So, um, yeah, we're big fans of Derek Jeter as well. Who we can get him on. <laughs> yeah, we'll have yeah. to. <laughs> Easy get. Yeah, I think so. Um, Jordan, we mentioned that you've got an incredible uh, array of experiences. I'm just going to read out a few of them here to give people an understanding. You've, you're currently uh, in corporate partnerships with the New York Red Bulls in the MLS. You've been there for the last 18 months. Prior to that, premium partnerships at BSE Global, which is the Brooklyn Nets, advertising at Time Out Magazine, sponsorships and commercial revenue at MLB uh, International, where you were in Australia with the Australian Baseball League. And then prior to that, entry-level role, at uh, lacrosse loggers back in, in 2010. Um, you've had this consistent theme of sales and commercial development through your whole career. W what is it that you enjoy most about that space in sport? You know, honestly, it's, it's the, the passion. Um, I've always, I've always admired, um, you know, on the playing side growing up, um, being involved in sports. And I think when there was that transition of, you know, I'm going to go from playing sports to admiring the business side of it. Um, it's something that I just couldn't, I just couldn't get away from. And every step of my journey has been, you know, a necessary step to get to the next step. Um, and I, I take nothing for granted. I think that, you know, I, I go back to that first job I got with the lacrosse loggers and you mentioned my first job, my first job. Yes. You know, I mentioned before, but, my first gig in sport and my first opportunity with lacrosse loggers was, you know, a jack of all trades. I was helping out on partnership marketing. I was helping out in corporate sales. I was helping out in on-field promotions, um, you know, looking, the, looking at the books at the end of the night with finance. Really got to, to dabble in multiple areas of the business. As far as a Saturday, I get a call from our GM and the mascots, you know, sick. And there's a tour for one of the schools nearby and they need somebody to fill in. And it's, you know, you don't hesitate. You, you raise your hand, you, you roll up your sleeves and you're Louis the logger for a day. Um, and that to me was always, um, it was an experience. <laughs> um, it was definitely an experience, but I'm happy I did it. And it's, it's definitely helped shape. I think who I definitely who I am today, but how I got to where I am because every journey, every step of this journey has been necessary. Um, the overseas experience with MLB, you know, the challenger brand, you know, it's, it's baseball, but it's, it's not cricket. It's not rugby. It's not footy or netball. So, um, it's all just been a necessary step, but I've loved the ride. If, if, if I wasn't, I would have, you know, you would have veered, veered off earlier on. I think everything's been, been amazing, um, and necessary. Was there a particular part of like going out to sell the sponsorships that you enjoyed more than the other roles that you had to do in that position? You know, one, one common theme, I think that's, that's been pretty clear throughout my career has always been, I've been on the challenger side, the challenger brand. So, um, I haven't been as fortunate to, you know, work for the Yankees during their dynasty years, um, and, and everything at the top where it's, it's, it's a little bit easier 
it's been challenging. Like I mentioned, baseball in Australia is it's it's not a tier one sport. Um, I like that. I've always I've always enjoyed that. You know, you, you make that call and you're you're talking to a CMO and and you're going through the process of why uh, why it would be or maybe a good fit for for the brand. Um, and in some cases, it's it you know you walk away and you're friends and you, you stay in touch and it's about relationship building. Um, I think every step of that journey, as I mentioned, it's always been about you know getting gritty, thinking creative, strategic. And for me, that that chase that you know that's not easy. It's not a layup. It's not right in front of you. You got you got to work hard. Uh, but that's the grind that I I truly like. I get up every morning and it's it's uh, you know it's not for everybody. But for me, it, it's it, it keeps me going. You, you know, you're in the right space when you enjoy the grind. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you know, you, you've mentioned that you enjoy that grind. You enjoy, you know, being challenged and, and trying to overcome, you know, pretty, uh, you know, tough circumstances. Are, are there any sponsorships that you you're particularly proud of over the journey so far? Um, I think you know, there's there's been a ton that I've either sold or been involved with, um, you know, I think in Australia when, when ANFA came on, I think that was a really exciting one. Uh, the Australian national preventative health agency was the naming rights for, for the ABL. Um, you know, the impact of sponsorship is also, um, really important to me. I think finding those value-based partnerships and that's, that's really key in my current role. Um, you know, we recently and, and are partnering with Kane University, so a local university um, here in New Jersey. And as part of the the partnership, it's it's not your atypical, you know, slap a sign on the wall, uh, LED, and, and you know, we'll do some branding, we'll do some social, and call it a day. There's experiential learning for students, career development, mentoring. Um, they're, you know, impacting the community. Positively building, helping build a mini pitch uh, in an underserved community. So for those that that you know, making soccer more accessible, that's that's part of our our mission here at the New York Red Bulls. So being part of that, where a partnership isn't you know just a quick, easy handshake branding deal. I think where you can get creative, thinking outside the box, but more importantly, having it be in, making a positive impact um, for both organizations and the community. Like to me, that's that's your home run. I think that's that's what we're looking to achieve. Mm. That's amazing. And yeah. going going way back, like when you were just getting into this space, um, like that's awesome. You can do these deals now, but I'm guessing it took time to to learn the necessary skills to be able to get to that point. Was there was there any particular person either in university or the loggers who who taught you to sell? And is there any particular lesson that kind of has stuck in your mind ever since? You know, I I would say. My first, like that first gig when I was in uh, MLB in the Australian Baseball League's league office, um, my my commercial manager at the time, Gabby Anger, um, he, he, you know, he was a legend in of himself. Like I got there and this guy, like he, he knew how to sell. Um, it's, you know, it's a small department and it, you know, a small history of, of selling commercially. Um, but he, he just went around about it the right way. And you know, I think through through my tenure there, and then in every career I've, I've been in, and every opportunity, it's about you know finding those people that you can latch onto and learn from. You know, always always keep learning. And for for me, and and, and watching Gabby and working alongside Gabby, um, he always just went about it the right way. Um, now he he's he's local. He's he's you know up in uh, up in Sydney. He didn't know a ton about baseball. And, and I always would kid, like, I think he, he used to mention he'd learn a lot from playing MLB the show. Like that was how he learned a lot about baseball. For me, I took that for granted because I grew up with baseball. I knew everything about it inside and out, which is helpful. Um, but it shows you don't need to know the sport inside and out if you can sell it. It's about positioning. Um, and so for Gabby, me learning the Australian landscape, you know, completely brand new, no Rolodex, no contacts. The culture is, you know, similar, but, but different at the same time and how to position yourself in a crowded marketplace, both in Sydney and Melbourne, Melbourne is, you know, uh, specifically it's, it's crowded. Um, so how do you separate yourself from the pack, especially when you're not the dominant 
you know, AFL, NRL, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, positioning and and going about it the right way, that was that was something I learned early on. Are you able to share like what, what was ALB's approach to that? Because particularly in Melbourne, I think Melbourne has more professional teams than any other city in the entire world. Like there's over 20 cross cricket, football, netball, basketball, baseball, softball, you name it. Um, what, what sort of things gave ALB a strategic angle? Well, I think you, you look at your assets, right? So because the Australian Baseball League, it's, it's similar. Think of it for, for us here in the States. It's, it's like a minor league baseball model, which, you know, fireworks, you know, in between game promotions and kids running across the field. Like that's, that's not atypical in, in most of the Aussie sports. So how do we take that flair and apply that to a market that isn't necessarily used to it? Um, so partially it's education, uh, partially it's, it's getting people to come out and you, you need to know where your, you know, your assets are and where you stand in the market. You know, I, I go back, I, I, quote Moneyball quite a bit, but Moneyball, the, the quote with, you know, if you play like the Yankees, you know, we're going to lose to the Yankees. That was, that was Billy Bean's big spick. Um, that was the same with the ABL. If you, if you try to play like the AFL and try to play with the big boys, you're going to lose out. You're going to lose out on those commercial dollars. So it's not necessarily to compete with them, but find your niche. And I think in local communities and pockets, you can find that. And for national brands, you just have to understand where are their key objectives? And is it community? Is it impacting the youth, you know, and, and, and T-ball, right? There's a massive um, following there and, and participation and, and Aussie rules. So similarly, how do you follow what is going well in one sport and replicate that and have a brand have access to it much easier? Um, so providing that assets and understanding what your assets are seem to be the two probably two key drivers for for us nice that's really cool mm. super interesting um Ru said before you know listed out your experience um and there's a you know a number of different roles that you've gone to when you're progressing from from job to job how does a, a salesman sell themselves i mean you you've, you've got to do it naturally i think um you know, I had a, I had an interesting stint when I was at Time Out on the advertising side. Um, it came a little bit more organically because Barclays Center was one of my clients, and I was tasked to to get them to to spend back with the magazine, which they hadn't had done since the arena opened. So naturally, arena opens, you're going to do a big marketing campaign, and then naturally you you pull back the reins. Um, so I was able to build relationships that way, and. Um, while the advertising experience was tremendous and, and has helped me, you know, to this day, I always had that knack of how do I get back into sport and speaking with those clients that are on the sports side, that was a natural transition. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm always happy to have conversations. I think that's the power of our industry is, you know, you're always networking. Um, you're always selling yourself, right? Any, any conversation you go in the elevator and you meet somebody, uh, you're always selling yourself and building relationships. And if, and when there are opportunities that make sense for you and your personal life and where you are in your, in your life, you can strike those up and continue to pursue them. Or in some cases it's let's just stay in touch and how can I be a resource for you? Um, but I've always been um, an advocate for, for networking and, you know, building relationships with anyone and everyone you can. So it sounds like it starts well before the job actually becomes available. <laughs> yeah. A hundred, yes, a hundred percent. Amazing. Um, and what, what about um, your most recent role, the role you're in now? Talk, talk, talk to us about the um, the process that you have to go through to to get that job. You know, when you're at that senior manager level at a major MLS club, wh what does the interview and application process look like for someone in your position? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think for, for us in the MLS too, where it's a sport that's, you know, definitely on the rise um, and, and challenging those those big four, if you will, with NFL, MLB, NBA and, you know, NHL. Um, the process is very similar. So it's, it's in that same boat. What have you done? What experience do you have tangibly? Um, obviously, when you're starting off and earlier in your career, it's a little bit more challenging. 
So it's what are those internships like? Where have you volunteered? What have you done? Um, you know, I think back to when I was in college or university in this case, um, you know, a internship was suffice and that's what was being asked for. And there were, there were plenty in the program that yeah, I don't need an internship. I'll just, I'll, I'll get a job. And they probably struggled out of the gate. And so at that time, it was imperative for me to get one, if not two, and just layer on that experience because then you get your first job. And then from there, after your first job, you're growing and you're growing and you're growing. So when I got to the stage with, with MLS, the New York Red Bulls, you know, they, they want to understand like, what have you done and what, what can you do? Where do you see your value? Um, it's got to make sense. Um, you've got to obviously have, you know, a knack for selling and a, you know, an interest in selling. Um, I don't think there's a right path and I would can't stress it enough. I think because I, um, you know, I'm a perfect case of that, of you don't need to have 20 years, 10 years, what have you of sponsorship only experience. You don't need to just have ticket sales experience. You might have marketing experience. You can come from all facets. Um, and I think that's always an important lesson to remember is that there isn't a right path, right? Whatever path you're on is the right path. So for me to get where I am, and if someone was interviewing for, for my role, it doesn't necessarily mean they had to have the exact experience that I had. Um, you know, everyone's got a different way that they go about selling and prospecting. Um, but understanding what your value prop is for the organization. And, you know, like I said before, it's, it's knowing your assets, knowing what you're good at and how you can bring value to, in this case, employer, but in the sales process to the brand. When you say that you don't have to have this like linear pathway into a specific job, you remind me a lot of um, the career story of a guy called David Pryles. David Pryles is the CEO of Hockey Australia and uh, he used to be an investment banker for about 15 years and um, he tried time and time again to swap into sports, kept getting knocked back and then eventually got a job as a commercial development manager at Cricket Victoria and that was because, as you say, he thought about what's a value proposition to the organization. And he said, these are my transferable skills. These are my contacts. This is what I can do in the first 90 days. And he got the job. He then had a 10 year goal to become a CEO and he got there in five. So I think what you're, what you're saying is, is absolutely right. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. That's, I mean, that's the journey that we're looking for, right? Is there's just, you know, I think for those that are looking to break into sports is they're looking for the answers and, just knowing that there isn't a right path is important and reminding yourself that day. Cause there's going to be days that you, you hit a wall and you know, you, you might want to give up. Right. And it's like, is this right for me? Is, is sports right for me? And you gotta, you gotta find dig deep and you gotta find out, you know, what is, what is your purpose? What do you really want to do and how are you going to get there and try to come up with that map for yourself? Nice. Let's um, let's zero in on the, the sales skills part of, of your role. Um, what are those three key skills that you need to be successful in your job? So off the bat, prospecting, and I, I would layer on strategic prospecting is, is imperative. Um, you know, for, for us, especially within the, the MLS space uh, and the New York Red Bulls, is we're in a crowded market. So, you know, not necessarily fishing where all the fish are, but understanding where the fish may be and how are we... How can we be the first to get there, right? And and strategically prospecting that and not saying, hey, I, I, I know X, Y, and Z sponsor, I'm going to reach out to them, you know, or if there's a partnership that was just announced, you can bet every other team and property and agency is reaching out to that brand. So how do you find the challenger brand? How do you find that Y brand's competitor? How are you reaching out to them and positioning yourself? So strategically prospecting being one. Um, also solution and I would say like objective based selling. So in the sense, it's not so much about, and it isn't about us saying what we can do and this is our offering it, take it or leave it. Um, you know, that, that's different, right? Like a standard old school ad where you're selling a, you know, a, a square box. It's not like that for, for us in the partnership space, you have to understand, you know, what is their pain points? What are their objectives? And where can we formulate a mutually beneficial partnership? Um, of course, commercially great, but what are those objectives and, and how can we piecemeal that together? Um, and it takes time. 
Uh, and the last is just, it goes back to what I was saying earlier is like confidence. You, you have to be confident. You have to be confident in yourself, uh, in what you're doing. You have to be confident in your product and what you're selling. If you're not confident in your product, it's going to show in your sales pitch. Um, and you have to be confident in the process and what you're selling through and through. So the uh, solution that you provide and that proposal, that it actually is going to be successful. If, if you're coming up with a plan and a program that it's not ticking any of their objectives, um, but hey, this is what we need to sell, it's, it's not going to work out. Um, so taking a step back and just being confident um, and transparent is, is, you know, three, three key traits. It's a no. terrific breakdown. Um, I just want to focus on confidence for a sec. Did you have that from day one or did that develop over time? And when, when do you reckon that started to become a really strong feeling for yourself when you were doing your job? I, I've always, um, I, I can say I, I haven't always been confident. I got out of college and I'm, you know, I told you like that first role at the loggers, that jump from the loggers to then interviewing at MLB's headquarters. And now all of a sudden I'm, I'm with the big boys now. Um, for me, that jump created a little bit of confidence. It's like, I can do this. Um, also just diving in, like I didn't have an option. Like after the interview and they confirmed, you know, this job isn't here at, at HQ. It's, you know, uh, all, all the way in Australia. Like I got on that plane and when I was, you know, landed at, at you know, Sydney's airport. I'm, I, I got to figure this out. I, I've got to do it. Like, I don't have a choice. Um, and you learn through practice. Like I meant, you learn from your mistakes. I think that's valuable. I think there's a lot to be learned from, from failure. Um, and I think that's just part of the process. So repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, and nobody's perfect. So, you know, once you can get over that, hump of, I don't have to be perfect. You know, you, you control the controllables at the end of the day. Um, you know, you're in the hall of fame. If you fail, what, six out of, you know, 10 times, right. You're, you're one of the best players of all time that in 400. So just continue to find the wins, you know, our, our industry and then specifically in the partnerships role and in the sales role, ticket sales, what have you, um, it's failure day in, day out. So, was I confident from the beginning? No, like you, you, but you learn to get gritty. You learn to have tough skin. Um, and you learn to find where to find those wins because they're not always going to be six, seven, eight figure deals. Like that's just when you, especially when you start your career, you know, it's, if you're on the ticketing side, it could be a mini plan. You know, if you're on the partnership side, it, it could be a local community partner. Um, you might be working in a smaller property but you build that confidence with small wins and just finding your wins. Your wins might not be a sale. It could be scheduling a meeting, having a good conversation with somebody. Um, those are the wins that you layer on. And the more wins you can get, like at the end of the day, you get, you control the controllables and you, you, you lay it all out there. And that's, that's what you have to do day in, day out. Just to give a bit of um, relativity and uh, to people out there who uh, are looking to develop their confidence, how many years do you think it took from, say, leaving college to feeling confident in your job? Because I know when I started my career at Cricket Australia, I arrived at this organisation that I had looked at in bright lights for a long time and uh, wasn't very confident at work and just kept thinking, oh, when, when am I going to finally feel confident at work? Like, when is this suddenly going to hit me? Um, so for people out there who are thinking like, you know, when is this going to change? How, how long was that process for you? You know, there, there's different, that's a, that's a great question because there's different layers of, of confidence for, for me, that jump of just like, am I, am I going to make it in sports? Australia, like when I came back from Australia, I was riding, I was riding a high where I felt like I can, I can conquer anything, but then I moved into advertising and then all of a sudden I'm back at square one. Cause I don't know what a CPM is. Um, and then all of a sudden I'm there for a year and it takes time. Uh, when I was at, at BSC for, for almost six years, I started off when I go into the interview process and they said, this guy doesn't have any luxury suite experience or very limited luxury suite experience. And, and on the suite license side, like that's, it's a long sales process. It's very similar to partnerships. Um, how are we hiring him? Like, what is it? And, you know, I knew full well, like I'm going to position myself the best I can. I knew full well, like this is going to be a learning curve in the beginning. And in the beginning, like 
I got thrown right out there, start making calls, start prospecting, figure it out. Um, it wasn't easy in the beginning, but you get your feet underneath you. And as I mentioned before, you learn to add and layer on those wins and it just creates a more compelling story. And now you fast track, you know, after a year, after two years, three years, that confidence is, is sky high. And then all of a sudden you're the one that are helping bring on, you know, the, the new guys, new girls that are, that are joining the team and showing them the rope. So once you get your feet underneath you and can, you know, understand the product of what you're positioning and, and property you're representing and just feel comfortable, then all of a sudden you can, you can, you can speak to it positively and be confident about it until you start your next one. And then you, it might take a learning curve again, but you have to layer on what did I learn from my time at the ABL with MLB? What did I learn with advertising? And when I started with the Red Bulls, I have this portfolio of, of varying levels of confidence because of the varying, um, you know, integrations that I, that I work through. So it, for me, it's a compelling story for myself that I can just feel confident in. I can do this. Um, and I think anyone trying something new, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a learning curve, right? And that's, that's the whole point of trying something new is you got to put yourself out there. Sounds like those little periods of uncomfortableness never, never end. But as you say, you, you enjoy the grind and, and the grit of it. So perhaps it's something you just keep seeking out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hey, um, Jordan, can you understand a little bit around, you know, how your, your day looks? So, you know, it sounds like to be a successful salesperson, you've got to be really structured about, you know, the process and, and, and whatnot in terms of what you do day to day. What does a, a day look like for you? How, how do you sort of structure your time? Yeah, I, you know, I would say a lot of it, <clears throat> it's, it's important to, for me, I learned like time blocking was, was an asset, something you can do to start your day. Um, it can be overwhelming, especially when you factor in your, your personal life that you want to separate when you're at the workplace is yeah, I've got an inbox that's over flooding. I've got proposals due. I've got to hunt, right? Cause I'm in sales and you always have to be hunting. Um, I've got to get back to this internal, um, email chain. And as the day goes on and it starts, there's interruptions, whether it's more emails, whether it's, it's teams calls or, or, or zoom calls, um, colleagues that, that, you know, are, are sitting next to you if you're in the office. Um, so how do you avoid those distractions? For me, time blocking has always been helpful and, and like a key asset of just, all right, I'm going to start my day. I'm going to, I'm going to do some reading. I'm going to understand what's going on in, in the industry, in the market. I want to be on top of it. Um, there's a plethora of obviously resources out there and, and, and obviously amazing podcasts like this one that you can always just learn. And I think that's important to start the day. Um, I have to say, I can't do that for, for four hours, but how do you carve out a section of your day to do that? And then how do I get through a certain amount of emails for, for another period of time? Then I'm going to go into prospecting, right? Because I need to continue to prospect. And what does that outreach look like? All right, what do proposal follow-ups look like? Because now I'm going to carve out time just to do proposals. Um, but going as far as also the personal side, I mentioned you keep that, you know, when you're at work, you're, you're, you're in at work, right? Um, but you need to take a lunch and you need to take care of your, your, you know, your personal life. So if it's going to the gym, like carve that out, put that in your, in your diary, in your calendar, block that out, take a lunch. You, you owe it to yourself and you got to take care of yourself. Physical and mental health is important. So um, relationships for myself, my wife and the kids, like if there are certain activities I need to be out of the office for, block that out there, communicate to your manager early and often. So for me, time blocking kind of sets the precedent um, in over communicating what I have going on. But as I mentioned, I think that putting things in certain sections and blocking through throughout the day is imperative. And if you have extra time at the end, sure. Then you go back to like, what do you want to do? Um, and you can, you can kind of spray and pray a little bit wider at that point, but staying disciplined, it's hard. It's really hard because there's a lot of distractions out there. Um, but I think time blocking definitely helps. If, if you had to prioritize one of those tasks between 9am and, and 12pm, what, what would you do during the, that period? Um, you know, I do like, I do like to reach clients early. Uh, I think it's, it's important. So if there's a lot of, uh, new outreach or follow up outreach, I try to do that in the first half of the day. 
and then more administrative, you know, if I'm creating a proposal or, or working on a, you know, a digi deck, um, that might be on the latter half. Nice. Love it. It's very interesting just learning about how yeah. people work. And in, interestingly, um, last week, our guest was Melissa Lawton, who is the chief content officer at Sale GP. And she said one of her work habits was every morning she reads industry newsletters such as yourself. So, um, yeah, trick for players at home. If mm. the best are doing it around the world, <laughs> might be a good idea for you too. <laughs> um, but Jordan, it all it all sounds pretty glamorous. You're working with these incredibly big teams with some of the biggest sponsorship deals in the world. What are some of the not so sexy sides of, of corporate sales? Yeah, um, it's a grind. I think I, I always go back to that. Like it's first and foremost, it's it's not easy. Um, yes, there are properties that could you know make it easier. Uh, but it's not easy for them either. Um, so it's a grind. The sales cycle on the partnership side, suite license side, like those, those are not overnight. Those aren't weekly. Those aren't even monthly in some cases. In some cases, it's years. So understanding the sales cycle and being okay with that. You know, I mentioned that success doesn't happen overnight. So continuing to, you know, understand that, live that, breathe that. And how do you develop and cultivate these relationships and grow these relationships? Um, patience goes hand in hand with everything I've just said is you, you can't get impatient and that's tough, especially early on. You talk to a brand, you see, there's a good fit. You have a great chat. And in some cases it, it doesn't work out year one and to be patient and not, you know, devalue your asset is can't happen. Um, get desperate. Like you, it's got to be the right time. It's got to be the right fit. So being patient and understanding the sales process, um, rejection, I think in any form of sales, um, in the supermarket, you know, would you like a sample? Like you get rejected, you know, you, you're in ticket sales, you pick up the phone, you get rejected, you're in sweet licenses, you're in partnerships and you know, you have a meeting with the CMO and it's just like, this is not the right fit. It's okay. Like it's, it's okay. Um, but dealing with that rejection and understanding how to grow from there, it's it's imperative to success. And I think that I mentioned before, like relationship building being the art of the sale, um, it's imperative to any any sales process through and through is is patience, relationships, um, and just you know understanding how to grow through and through. I can imagine it'd be it'd be frustrating for some people who are big on their to do lists. And, you know, the mm. more they tick off, the better they feel about things. But I guess in your job, sometimes you've just got to sit and wait and there's not really much you can change. Yeah, like that, that's it. You, you just, you control the controllables. You, you, you come up with what are your uh, defined tasks and, you know, what are your home runs? What are your hits? What are your wins? And you just layer those on. You just keep going at it. Grind, grind, grind. Nice. Jordan, say you're, say you're back in college and you want to get some sales experience in sport and you approach a little league baseball club to ask if you can help sell their, their sponsorship. What would you say to convince the president of that club to, uh, to give you an opportunity? And, and what are some of those first steps you would take to, to get your first say $2,000 sponsorship from a, from a local business? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great one. Um, especially on the local level, because that that's going to hit the heart. Um, Obviously, what are the objectives of the club? And, you know, what, where can this money go for raising $2,000? You know, can the kids get new mitts? Can it help, you know, support bats? Is there, is there a trip to, to go out to see the Melbourne Aces and learn and meet, you know, some of the, the big leaguers and, and have a Q and A with those players? Like what, what and where, what are the objectives that the club is looking to achieve? And then from there, once we understand what are important objectives for the club, then let's flesh out some opportunities so that we can go to the community and find some community partners that you want to give back. And, you know, maybe they're an expat, maybe they played baseball when they were a kid and they just weren't aware and they want to know how they can get involved and, you know, knocking on doors and, you know, reaching out to, to local businesses and just figuring out how they can support the team. You know, I think grassroots is, is integral. I think in any sport, it's, it's how can we, how can we drive that in, in the power of sport and, and drive participation? So the more that a local community and a local business partner can do, it's it's just branching out and, and you know, asking those right questions. 
it's a great approach because I reckon every club out there, no matter what sport it is, would have like a long list of past players and friends, family who who love the club, but no one ever contacts them to ask them, would you be interested in, in sponsorship, any size, yeah. small, small or big? And so you're right, there's probably a huge opportunity for someone who wants to do that work to get an opportunity selling just by being willing to be that person. Um, so say, let, let's go back to the, the first part for a second. Say um, um, this this club, uh, hypothetical club, is doing their thing. They're pretty happy where they are. President's time poor, but the the student wants to get the opportunity. What what would you say as the student to the president to convince the president that you should give me some responsibility to sell on your behalf? Yes, yeah, you're you're here to make an impact. You're here to make a positive impact for the club. Like, what can I do? Um, of course, like if I'm, if I'm there and I think I can, with my experience can drive commercial revenue, that's great. But maybe that CEO, maybe, you know, the president thinks I don't, I don't need a commercial seller. Okay, great. What can I do? What areas of the business do you need help in? How can I help asking those questions? Right. And yes, understanding your value and, and what you can bring to the table. But I think you go back to asking that president, that CEO, like, what do you need me to do? Like, tell me to jump. I'll jump. Like, I want to get involved. I'm here to be a resource for you where resources are, are thin. Um, and I think just any type of experience, especially earlier on that volunteer experience, it's, it'll be tremendous. It might, it might not pay an immediate dividend with, with that club that leads to the job, but it'll layer it on. And who knows who you'll meet in that, you know, that, that, community outreach to those local businesses who knows you just you just don't know where life will take you mm. uh, i love that and it's like don't even if you get knocked back originally just don't take no for an answer find a way to to wiggle in mm. brilliant yeah. jordan we've got one last question for you this has been awesome to learn we've never really dived this deeply into sales in sport before so it's been been fascinating um finally if you could leave a note with one little piece of advice on the desk of a college student looking to build a career in commercial sport, what would you write on that note? It's a great question. Um, you know, a similar theme, I think, as I'd, I'd mentioned through and through, it's just just dive right in. Um, you know, don't be afraid of failure. Uh, immerse yourself as, as much as you can. Um, there's no right path. There's, there's no right journey. Um, but if, if you're in this and you're passionate about working in sport, it's, it's unlike anything else. And you just got to roll up your sleeves. You got to get dirty. You got to be, got to be Louis the logger. You know, if that's what it takes for a night, it's, it's doing that. It's not necessarily where you start, uh, but where you end, um, and having that, you know, the goal of the end in mind, um, no, it's a grind. No, it's not always going to be a straight line. So I, you know, we talked about it earlier. I think that's, that's the advice I said. It's just there's not a right path, but just keep your head down, grind, you know, and it, it'll work out at the end. That's a great message. Be Louis the Logger. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Ruse, we've had Jordan today, but um, are there any other sort of episodes in that realm? I know you mentioned we hadn't done a lot of corporate sales before, but in terms of that sponsorship zone, any other episodes people can listen to? Yeah, well, uh, we, we mentioned um, David Pryles earlier on, CEO of Hockey Australia. If people want to listen to his career journey uh, and find out why it's relevant to this conversation, that was episode 172, I believe. And then um, uh, we actually had one of Jordan's uh, former colleagues at BSE Global, the Brooklyn Nets, good friend of the show, Aman Alawalia. He came on back in episode 57 when he was at the Kansas City Chiefs right around Super Bowl time, which has just happened uh, mm -hmm. recently and uh, so he w he uh, was working in uh, the analytical side of sponsorships and partnerships um, so interesting to get his perspective and then another good one is uh, Michael Wolfert from episode 153 also Super Bowl connection he was working at the Cincinnati Bengals uh, this time last year and so if you want to hear what it's like on the commercial side in the week of the Super Bowl, mm. then um, here's a good one to check out too. 153 for, for Michael. Brilliant. Well, Jordan, thank you very much for your time. I know it's, uh, it's getting somewhat late there, uh, but thank you so much just for sharing some of that career advice that you've given us today and just the insight into what it's like working in commercial sales in sport. You've got some 
awesome experience. Red Bulls, obviously, BSC, back in the ABL as well, the Melbourne Aces. So it's just great getting that insight and, and hearing about all the things that you do each day to, to get those sales over the line is, uh, is super, super cool. So thank you again for, for your time. No, thank, thank you, guys. I appreciate you, uh, you having me on. Guys, it's time now for the people's favorite segment, Ask Sports Grad, where every week we answer a question from our community. If you'd like to ask a question, firstly, become a Sports Grad member at www.sportsgrad.com.au slash community. And then you can add your question to the channel named Ask Sports Grad and at our Ask Sports Grad events. So, Rubes, this one comes from Acacia. She says, how do you know when you can slash want to say no to something? Great question. Now, um, uh, it's an important one because you don't want to feel overwhelmed and you don't want to be spread too thin and do a bad job at at a lot of things. Yeah. Um, However sometimes finding out the right thing to put all your energy into can be a tough task in itself. So, you know, we're talking about career direction here. What, where do you spend a lot of your time? So um, for Acacia, for some context on her, she is uh, in the last year of university. And uh, what's pretty typical of people at this stage is that they're, they're in the discovery stage of their career. They're still trying to find out what they like, what they don't like. And so in terms of all the different things that you might do when you're discovering what you want to spend all your time doing, mm. you got to say yes to everything. And so your calendar and your week is just going to build up and up and up and up and up and your capacity is going to be you know full to the brim. And that, that's a good thing. After doing that for long enough and saying saying yes to a lot of things, you're going to, you're going to quickly realize what am I good at and what do I enjoy? And that will help you decide which ones to double down on. And so it's at that point when you've got enough data on enough different fields of interest that you can say, actually, these are the areas I really like. These are the areas I don't like. So I'm going to cut that one off. And now I'm going to spend more time doing the ones that I do like. So I think you can start saying no to things once your capacity is absolutely full and you know that this is what I like and this is what I'm good at and this is where it's worth me spending more time. So it's kind of hard to give you a time point for how long that takes because you could try a lot of different things in say a three month period and know pretty quickly what, what you're suited to. Yep. But if you only pick up an opportunity once every few months and over the course of a year or two, you've got five different things to, to go off, then getting to that point where you have that one thing that you're particularly interested in is going to take a lot of time. So that's why I recommend to Acacia and to anyone else, just throw yourself in there. If you mm. want to find out what to say no to and where to spend your time, throw yourself in there to a lot of different things because that's how you'll find out the fastest. Now, the beauty of that process too is once you say yes to everything to then start saying no to almost everything and you end up with that one particular thing, that is the fastest way to become extremely good at what you do because once yep. you know exactly what you're good at and what you want to what you're interested in and you spend all your week doing it that's when your capability starts to grow exponentially and it's hard for other people to compete with you so yeah unfortunately it's it's a bit of a frustrating process but the discovery phase is necessary for anybody's career yeah um but you can find out faster by throwing yourself in there brilliant mate yeah i've got a bit of an example of that when i was at uh when i was working at revo in the early days it was the in-between part where I was working at the gym but also working at the sports centre. And the sports centre was great because I could manage indoor cricket and I loved it. It was really enjoyable. But there were still opportunities to do the, the gym stuff as well. And I kind of switched that off because I was like, I want to do this mainly. So it's exactly what you said there. You're just trying to figure out what, what you enjoy mm. and where the benefits are coming. And I could see a clear benefit of, of being part of that. I, I never knew that you were, used to do some gym stuff at Revo. <laughs> you wouldn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, st- I started off. I started off in the gym, just behind the desk, mm. doing the sign-ups. Were you coaching anyone through exercises? No, 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 no. God, no. Okay. I, <laughs> it's more of a... Uh, Sign members up, you know, account management, mm. clean the place when I'm done. It yep. was great. Oh. Awesome start because mm. it was like you, you're meeting people. You're getting experience sort of having conversations with people. So mm. 
It was an awesome start. Yeah. Well, I was going to say um, that was one of the experiences that uh, I cut off. So I did an exercise science and sport management degree. Yeah. So whilst yeah. I was doing my internships in social media and operations, I also was doing um, was also doing um, a uh, internship at a strength and conditioning firm mm. and um, realized pretty quickly that that wasn't for me. Yeah. And so uh, I cut that off and then doubled down on the sport management side, things that I, that yeah. I enjoyed more. So it does take time. But, you'll uh, you'll find it. it though. That's the main thing. Yeah, that's right. Great. Well, if you'd like to ask a question or ask our friends in sport a question, sign up to be a Sports Grab member each week. As we mentioned at the top of the episode, we jump on a weekly Ask Sports Grab event where it's an open floor for you to ask us or any industry professionals any of your questions. This Wednesday, we've got Melissa Lawton on to chat about social media and broadcasting, which is very, very exciting. All of these sessions are recorded, so when you join, you get immediate access to over 50 hours of exclusive content, which is uh, a fantastic feature and like Netflix of the sports industry, I'll say it again. <laughs> Find us on LinkedIn, plus give us some love with a rating if you enjoy the show. Subscribe on Apple or follow on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey, guys, one last thing before you go. If you'd enjoy a quick email from us each Friday on all the latest job openings, networking events, Q&As with industry professionals and latest podcast episodes, then subscribe to the SportsGrad newsletter. Head to our website, www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's also a link in our show notes to join.